I was watching some of your videos today. Oh, uh, yeah, mine or Jay's? Not yours. All right. Must must have been old ones, even though they've just been put up today or today or yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the Kiwi cameraman guy down at Rangiora in Christchurch. Yeah. Another YouTuber, and um, the police just trespassed him from the police station. He didn't even go into the place. Just walked up to the doorstep, recorded the sign saying "No recording," and thought. Yeah. Oh, I better not go in. Turns around, and then a couple of bobbies come down from the, the back area, and within you know 30, 30 bloody seconds, they're um, telling him to get off and not allowed to record and all this bullshit. And then they chased him down the road oh, okay. to unknown persons on the trespass notice, and that's it. Yeah. They it to him as an unknown person, and that's it. So he filed a complaint with the IPCA. And they came back saying that the trespass is valid, um, and they see no problem with what happened. <laughs> so, if the trespass is valid, who was the occupier? Well, the, the, I've, I've told them what the next step is to do, and that, that's why I put up those videos because yeah. I, I told them I'll, I'll try and find them all and put them up in succession. You can just watch them, but um, about the trespass notice that Mark Popperwell gave Paula. And yeah. Arthur Taylor was saying, use Section 23 of the OIA to find out what facts yeah. they were basing the, the reasonable grounds on to trespass her from that public building, because there must be reasonable grounds for that. And they came back to us and said, oh, because um, she took part in the filming. You know, oh, she, I saw that, yeah. She was being filmed, but she wasn't filming. She yeah. wasn't doing anything to do with the filming or the channel or the publication or the product or the editing or she had nothing to do with it. She was as much yeah, in yeah. it as anyone else in it. So, um, but yeah, that, that security guard, mate, what a fucking brain surgeon he is. 40, <laughs> yeah. 40 minutes. I'm standing there with the phone hanging out of my fucking top pocket, clear as day. And then he decides to come and ask me if I'm recording <laughs> real bright, spark, <laughs> real bright spark. That one. Anyway, yeah, yeah, so, so what do you think? I was looking at it going, okay, so they're going trespass, but as you pointed out, um, under Section 3 and Section 5, if, if you believe someone is, could be getting threatened or anything, you can stay there. But oh, then yeah. with all of the different things I've been looking at lately, it would also come into Section 5 of the Secret Commissions Act, 1910, because... When it comes to that section, anybody, like if, for instance, the person handing you the trespass or telling you your trespass is going to be the agent, right? And right. so therefore they're not the crown. So therefore they're not the principal. And so if they're not the principal, the principal cannot sign a document because they're not there. Only the agent can. So if you've got a person who's been trespassed, in any situation, if you've got, like you go to court, for instance, the judge is the agent of the crown. And for instance, if you're going up on a criminal charge, right, your lawyer is representing you. However, your lawyer is not the principal, you are. So therefore, um, the lawyer is your agent and he cannot contract with the crown, with the judge, because so, the judge is the agent. So the lawyers can't actually speak on your behalf to the crown? Yeah, it's like if you go into family court, um, and the case is always in regards to a child. So when it comes to that, the uh, the judge is the agent of the crown, and so therefore mum or dad is agent of baby or child. So when you take it that the crown is principal and baby is principal, neither are, but neither are before the courts and neither can contract because the agent can't contract on behalf of the principals. Secret Commissions Act, Section 5. What, a, what, what else have you discovered? Because... I, I know you were saying something about how to, you finally figured out how to hold judges accountable. And I know yep, how um, fun we're having with young Timothy down in Wellington. <laughs> yeah. Well, so when it comes to like, um, as I just did on, uh, when was it? Friday. Yeah. Friday was up in high court and um, ended up having um, a affidavit basically removed from here because of hearsay, because the person that stated in one of their paragraphs that they had first-hand knowledge of it did not have first-hand knowledge of it. 
So I mentioned to the court that that would be perjury. Um, yeah. And then after the other counsel had, or um, well, the counsel that was on the case, had turned around and gone through all of his submissions, I um, let the court know that um, I had just realized that something was missing from the bundle. Um, so we went over that. And then we went over the, the whole submissions mm -hmm. and the fact that um, everything that was contained within the submissions um, was to do with other court cases and therefore subject to res judicata and estoppel of preclusion, meaning that, um, that, that, that the um, submissions that they were trying to put forward had already had judgments on them and therefore could not be brought before a court again in regards to any type of matter. doesn't matter who the participants or are or um, the parties to the proceedings are, That's they cannot be, cannot be um, relitigated. So if you're in a criminal proceedings and they're going, oh, Your Honour, this gentleman's had um, three other previous criminal convictions for this and other convictions for that, they just need to point out that's res judicata and they can't be um, judged on again because there's already been... Yeah, when it comes to res judicata, though, there's multiple different types of res judicata. And so when you're going up in, in, in any type of court forum, if, like, for instance, if you've had, if you've got criminal convictions, for instance, um, you've all you've simply got to state them because they're going to go on those criminal convictions as to okay at this particular charge if yeah. we find you guilty how much are we going to sentence you to you know that type of thing sentence. and so the way in a way of having that reduced reduced right down is to just turn around and say well I'm sorry but every other bit of the history has had a judgment done on it and because of that judgment it's subject to estoppel or preclusion and so therefore you cannot take those matters into account when uh, making a judgment on this one. They've already been, there's already been a judgment and therefore, therefore it can't be brought forward to be relitigated again, which is what you do. Because they're still trying to bring that evidence back in and still argue about it, even though it's been decided. Upon. Yeah, because there's anything that's been subject, like it doesn't matter if it's a warrant or whatever it is. Um, they're all, like if they issue a warrant, they made a decision. If they um, sentence you to prison, they've made a decision. They've all had judgments. Yeah. So they've had a judgment, either a, either a minute, a decision, or a judgment. And because of those three things, um, you cannot turn around and um, bring the case on, you know, like try and use that litig what's already been litigated before. Mm. You don't, they don't have that avenue open to them anymore. Yeah. But uh, the difference is, the thing is, if you don't mention it, that it's um, estoppel of, of um, preclusion, yeah. Then, as I was told, well, if I hadn't um, mentioned it, it would have been taken into account. So, realistically, to be able to have your rights upheld in regards to anything that's had a judgment before, you've got to turn around and state, like, I called it issue preclusion because that's what, it, that's what it's called on Google or wherever you look in law. But then I was informed by the judge that they call it estoppel of preclusion. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's fine, as long as, as, long as it's not over you. <laughs> Kiwi slang on it from the rest of the countries. <laughs> well, yeah, but then it, it, it gives an interesting argument because um, like how you were talking about holding judges accountable, there's a document called the Judicial and Crown Immunity. Um, it's, there's a report done on it. Um, and Bajan, paragraph... Bajan case. Sorry? Bajan case. That's weird. That's better than I can see you. <laughs> It looks, it looks weird looking at the, the back of your head. Cameras around. I thought I'd show you what my whole desk area looks like. So I thought, yeah. oh, you can have but a you look. You know, um, under the paragraph 140, it gives in that document, it gives you all of the different ways of being able, able to hold a judge accountable if you think they've made a wrong decision. And we were always told appeal, judicial review are the two options. They are not actually limited to that at all. Um, if you can prove that um, they haven't followed the procedural steps within statutory legislation, in other words, the legislation that, like, that they use, Crimes Act, whatever, um, then you're able to turn around and hold, that, hold the um, judicial officer accountable through civil and criminal um, you know, prosecution. You can take a civil case against them and seek relief of um, criminal, cr cr uh, a criminal charge. So, just so there's more than just... So just hypothetically here, I mean... We'll just use this as an example. Say, God forbid, Tim Black does anything wrong in your cases. Um, you just need to document that and then file a civil suit against him. And then I think it's—I think you've said before at the um, 
in the end of it, in the redress or the, what, you're, what you're seeking at the end is to ask for a criminal prosecution if he's done something against the law, yeah? Yeah, so, so in your statement of claim, you turn around and you state your cause to action, your background to that cause to action, um, and then you give the timeline for example, background. For an example, say, um, say Tim, because say, you, you, I've heard you say functions and powers, so can you explain for people that are going to be watching this? So, um, like, so, okay, so you've got the functions and powers of a judge. Number one um, is to um, basically keep the community safe, you know, keep kids net safe from um, harm. Number two is um, any criminal matters. Number three is um, rehabilitation. And number four is speed and efficacy of the court. And then you've got what you call your stat the um, the powers the powers of it, which is the statutory legislation. So any legislative act in New Zealand, that's you know, they 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 have jurisdiction on those acts. Okay, so statutory legis statutory jurisdiction gives you um, gives them the power to um, preside over a um, hearing or whatever a court proceeding um, in regards to that particular act. And then you've got the inherent jurisdiction, which allows them to, um, if there isn't, a, if they well, put it this way, if they believe that there's a there's no law at the moment yeah. or no section of law to cover what they're trying to make a decision on, they have the power to, you know, that's where you get your case case law from. So um, because they've made a decision, it's not based on law. So the difference being is like in a statutory jurisdiction, like a district court, there are judges. In the high court, there are justices because they have inherent jurisdiction. Well, yes, but they can still do the statutory jurisdiction oh, as well. Of course, of course. You know, any, yeah. any, so the, the only court that's got inherent jurisdiction oh. is the high court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the yeah. lower judges can't do what the high court can. Well, you would think not, but uh, when it comes to family <laughs> court, they uh, tend to do what they like. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I've, just, I've just been watching, there's so many different types of them, you know. The land yeah. judges and the and the um, oh god, what was the other one? Well, called? yeah, but they're all restricted to the same functions and powers. It, so it, um, at at the end of the day, they all still have um, they could all still be held accountable. Okay. Um, where they turn around and say that it's only the governor general, uh, to me that's correct to a point because if you can bring a civil case and prove um, where they didn't follow the procedural steps, then at the bottom of your statement claim, it has relief sought. And so you'd put down there, the, you, know, you want them criminally charged under section such and such of the Crimes Act. And so if you're able to prove your case, then that, that you know, um, what it comes down to is, for me, is to remove the, the judicial immunity yeah. is as simple as have they followed all the procedural steps within the statutory legislation they're using? Because the inherent jurisdiction um, to me, really just comes into that's an extra power where, okay, um, it doesn't exist in law as they can see it in the statutes. So therefore, they've got to be able to um, implement something else on, on the spot there to be able to make the decision, hence case law. So, hang on, judicial immunity you just uttered. What? what judicial immunity, well, I mean, judicial immunity case. just basically is the same as the Diplomatic Immunity Act. They are immune. They're they're immunity from prosecution. However, that's only if they haven't done anything in bad faith, which could, which could be considered, you know, not following procedural steps. Which brings um, not brings us on to like two seventy two of the Law Con Act as well. Yeah, because yeah, and um, in that judicial um, immune, but unless bad faith can be proven. Yes, and if you look at the judicial and crown immunity document, at yep. the end of that document. It's, it's actually quite good because what they do is they, they list every single statute in New Zealand, but only list the bad faith section in it, or on each one, and then they tell you within, within that document um, who and how they can be, who can be held accountable and how they can be held accountable. That's good. I'm, I'm going to put a link to that. Now, it's the Bajant case, 197 page or whatever it is, eh? Yeah, it's, yeah, but it's only, I think, it doesn't end up being a whole 197 pages because there's other documents within it. Um, but it, it's a very, very interesting read if you if you want to find out, like, for instance, a lot of people think Crown is things like Crown Law, the judges, um, you know, all that kind of thing. The registry is limited to that, but it's actually not. 
It's anybody who comes under parliament in the crown capacity. So that can be, um, you know, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Corrections, all that type of thing, all of their employees, um, anybody who's funded by the government, even, even NGOs. So non-government organizations are also crown when it comes to that kind of thing. So, so um, crown. sorry? So police are crown. Yes, of course. So your police are crown, um, so that means, um, for instance, when you consider it that way, New Zealand Defence Force, New Zealand Army, New Zealand Navy, okay, you've got all of those different departments. Um, anybody who's within a government department, you could go into the Ministry of Education, government-funded, Crown employees. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so therefore, um, as, if, the, if you've got an employee, we're under the state sector that says you've been delegated under Section 41, been delegated the jobs, you're obviously a Crown employee. And so therefore, um, anybody who's Crown is considered to have judicial immunity. Um, you know, search with, not as high as judges, but um, they still have judicial immunity. And so therefore, when it comes to that kind of thing, um, all they have to do is act in bad faith and that immunity is not. So how do you show bad faith? Well, it's not really that hard to be able to show bad faith. I mean, if somebody's turned around and um, made a statement that um, is not true about you, or they have, say, for instance, you're in a family court case, and they bring a case against you, um, and then they turn around and supply false information within an affidavit, or they put false information on the business records. Okay, that's acting in bad faith. Okay. So when, when they're acting in bad faith, they're, they're accountable for it. What if it's an error? You bring it to their attention. Of course, they won't, they won't correct the error. They'll just put another entry in to say that this is needs. Well, to be. No, yeah, but okay, then, then, you, then you're going under Privacy Act, 20, uh, Privacy Act 2020, and then you're going under IP, uh, IPP 6 and 7, under yep. Section 22. I love you know, these so IPPs. When it, <laughs> yeah, so when it comes to that, um, they're required to, um, as, as long as you supply them the information that's going to be corrected, they're required to do so in 10, within 10 days. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. so, yeah, I mean, like, and if they don't do so, then obviously they're acting in bad faith. So whatever, I mean, if it, if it was OT, for instance, it's section 444. So, you know, if, they, if the social worker doesn't want to um, correct that information, obviously they're acting in bad faith. Otherwise, I mean, what, what other reason wouldn't they correct the information? If, if they believe it's... False or well, there's many, you know, there's you know many, I mean? really, isn't no, there? I'm like, just trying to think of the gray areas that they could scoot around it, sort of thing. But playing devil's well, advocate. I mean, when it, when, it, when it comes down to it, um, it's a well known fact that information is supplied falsely within affidavits from Odonga Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Even all the way back to the Sips days and social welfare days. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it's been going yeah. on for what, six decades? Decades, so. Decade, generations. Yeah, I mean, if, if it hadn't been going on for generations, we would not be having a Royal Commission of Inquiry, would we? No, no. What was that, 45 years ago? Yeah, like, 45, 50 45 years ago, yeah. 1970 up to 2000. I think they only... Yeah, no, it's got to, I think it's got to be before that because the um, original um, Social Welfare Act for going to Kikim in 64. Oh, okay. It might be before that, then, 1950. Because yeah, it was 64, then 68, then 74. Then I think it was 85 it got changed. Yeah, they change it all back and forward all of the time. The silly thing is, if you actually look at the acts right back to back into those days, the act has not changed. It's still the same. Just it what, literally is still the same. Just reworded or no, they haven't actually reworded most of it. They've left it all the same. They've just made it in a new font and made it in a new document. And a lot, a lot of the times, like even when you've got the repealed sections or the revoked sections. The, the, the thing we ended up learning was that that doesn't make the sections gone because there's always the original draft that was put through the select committee and therefore, as they class it, the white paper document. Right. And so the white paper document, even though, like, for instance, in the OT, Section 67 was repealed and revoked back in 2019, I'm pretty sure it was, yeah. um, when, when they had the um, Hastings Hospital case. Right. And, um, but it is still able to be used. And as you were saying, our, our favourite little judge... Timmy! Oh no, nothing's worse than Timmy! With a Thor huh? Bye-bye now! Timmy! 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 Implemented yeah. that when it came to us, in, 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 our, in our family case. So, yeah. um, yeah. when yeah. it comes to those yeah. sorts of yeah. things... How can, he, yeah. how can he be using a repealed section? 
scratch. Well, here's the interesting thing about that, Mark. When it comes down to it, how I was saying estoppel or preclusion, yep. they have section 18A, which is in regards to subsequent child. Right. Now, if you take the estoppel of preclusion, and since I had it confirmed on Wednesday that if I hadn't stated that, that it would have been taken into account, that quite clearly tells me that um, a subsequent child one, when, when Oranga Tamari could do a section 18A, is based on the child's um, grounds from before, the, yeah, the first so child that's wanted to get. History. So res judica, or you know, like you say. Yeah, so you do the, you, 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 you um, put into play the estoppel of preclusion under res judicata, and mm. 18A is no longer a factor because it can't be a subsequent child because so you just stop them from using all of the evidence from it. Yeah, so they'd have to have new evidence in every new child. It, it, there wouldn't be a subsequent child at all, would they? Exactly, and that's, that's another thing I've been looking into in the last couple of days. I've got to do a bit more research on it. But when you, when you go and you have issues with OT, and they have their care and protection concerns, as they reckon, and then all of a sudden you get told, well, if you do this over the next six months, right, then uh, we, we, we can return your child, right? So I've been looking into that a bit. And um, so how they have the estoppel of acquiescence, you can actually implement that and state to them, okay, look, if you're saying that I'm going to have my child returned in six months on the six month one to eight plan, yeah. I want that plan subject to estoppel of acquiescence. Okay, and what if they say no? Then you're not prepared to do it because they should be prepared to do it because of the fact that when it comes down to it, Oh, sorry, not a top stop of acquiescence, promissory estoppel. Okay? Right. Because the promissory estoppel then locks the document into an end date. Okay. And yep. so rather than the parents that like, like um, I mean, everybody knows, I mean, we've been through it as well, where they keep doing these six monthly plans and they change the goalpost all the time. Right. And so the easy way that I've looked at around that is promissory estoppel, because at the end of the day, if the, if the document is subject to promissory estoppel, then they can't carry on after the six month period if you've met. As long as you have met what it says within there, like a normal agreement, sure. um, then if it's subject to that, and you see the other thing that comes into play as well is under section 131 EA, okay, under it's either subsection three or four, it quite clearly states that you've got um, within the time frame that's set. So it doesn't say that. Here's a six months plan. We'll come back and review it in six months under one section 135. What it says is if you fulfill those ob obligations and tasks and, obje and objection, sorry, objective tasks um, within that time frame, you'll be able to have your child back. Now, the, the key word within the context of that paragraph, within. So it doesn't have to be the full six months. So the re reality is you can go back to the court. Like it might take you, say, three months. So why should your child stay in care for another three months? Yeah, exactly. But they yeah, can, if you've fulfilled they, the obligations, they can hold you to that promissory um, estoppel as well. Um, when it comes oh, down to it, yes, both parties, both parties will be kept to it. But what it means is, at the end of that six months, when OT go to go and do their one three five review, there's no review anymore because it's subject to promissory estoppel. Sure, sure. You you put you yeah. basically put that end date on it, and that's that. They can really yeah. Because what they tend to do is, when you have, when you've fulfilled the tasks, all of a sudden, uh, Jack in the Box pops up and goes along and goes, "Hey, now this is wrong." Yeah, well, you, you hear so that, that also stops that. You hear that from a lot of a lot of the parents. They go, "Well, look, mate, we jumped through every hoop they wanted. We even went over and above." what the plans were and the parenting causes yep. and all of the shit they put us through and they still haven't given us back our kids. So that would put an end to it. Yep, exactly. if they're honoring everything that they should be doing in the plan. But so that's the one. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly right. Because you see the, the other thing too, that, um, yeah, like it's, it's, it took me a while to realize this when they, when they turn around and they first get involved, there's always a report of concern. Make note of what the report of concern is, because once you've done the plan, or if, if you if you accept that there's a concern, right, and that, 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 that you, know, you accept these current protection concerns, then at the end of that plan, okay, it should only be those concerns. If they if they're now mitigated and gone, 
why is the child being helped? Hold on, it's because we've now got this issue with you, with a concern with your child being in your care. What's missing from that, though? See, that kind of segues onto it. Um, I remember asking you about this. I remember I had a gentleman ring me up. He's, there's something about the, um, the, the parents were arguing over one wanted the vaccine and one didn't want yes. the vaccine. And the parent, and yes, the, I remember that, yeah. And the, the, the uh, principal of the school ended up uh, calling the OT and um, they uplifted the kid from school. And he didn't know what the first step was. What is the yep. first step to do and how do you combat that straight away just to try and get something in the works? Because I know it's the old acquiescence. If you don't do things within a certain time frame, you're only making life harder for yourself. Yeah, um, well, okay, it's, it's like what I'm, what I'm um, looking at doing. Okay, um, normally I would say to you, okay, um, ask them what the care and protection concerns are. Right. But since I've um, been doing a bit of research, I would now turn around and say, um, you write a letter to them. And then what you do is you, you actually do it up like a PDF letter. Um, and what you'd be asking them, okay, is these are the facts of the case presented. Um, these are what I believe the facts of the case are. You now have 14 days subject to a stop of acquiescence. If, I, if there is no response within that 14 days, that will be taken as tacit agreement and therefore a order sought under High Court Rule 8.48 and 15.16. And then, so if, the, if normally if you send that off to the social worker, um, the social workers take forever to get to their emails. Yeah. And so if they don't reply to you within that time frame, then what, then what the case is supposed to be with that kind of thing is after you haven't had that reply, you go and make the application to the court the court then turns around and gives you an order because there was no no response. And then what that does, what that does in law terms is because they because it was subject to a stop of acquiescence and tacit agreement, it's now no longer able to be used in the court case against you. Right. And so therefore, um, by the time by the time they go for, and try and do an order or anything, it's normally roughly around that 14 day time frame. Right. But they will always apply for a Section 68 Care and Protection Order, which requires an affidavit. What are they going to put in the affidavit? The stuff that they've told you is wrong. However, you've now counteracted it by going and getting, doing your letter. You've got no response. Hopefully, if you've got no response, you go and get the court order. You've just, you've just um, rebutted their whole affidavit because there's a court order saying it can't be used. And if they do respond? Within if the they do respond, then they've got to respond with what is actually the, their concerns and stuff like that. And then you can turn around and still make it subject to a promissory estoppel. True, true. Yeah. So what you're saying, what you're saying to them then is, well, okay, yes, if the, you're saying this is wrong. However, I'm saying I don't believe that is wrong. Okay. So we now have a bit of a disagreement. You're ask, you're saying that you'll allow the child to stay with me if I agree to this. That's fine, but it's got to be subject to promissory estoppel and we're not doing an FTC. Because the FTC is where the care and protection concerns, where they want you to agree to that. Yeah. So by, by doing it early, if I, if I had known all of this back when ours first happened, I would have implemented all, uh, would have looked at implementing it then. It's a bit on the harder stage when they've gone into the care, but it's still able to be, you know, you know we can still try and put that process in place if we don't get a response then go for the court order. Certainly put the shits up the social worker. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like they'll, they'll be going to the, um, you know, they'll, they'll end up going to the actual um, lawyer themselves within the company, within the um, organisation, going, what do I do here? Mm. You know, because it's, it's all moving in different ways. But, I mean, like the, um, it was it was quite strange to, on Wednesday to, like, I just thought, I'll implement it and see if it works. And, yeah, I got told straight, straight out um, on the hearing that, um, if I hadn't implemented it, what was in these submissions would have been taken into account. Yeah, so it just goes to show. It's the only yeah, way so it just goes to show. It, it does actually work. Out sometimes is to actually do it yourself and see if it works and what works and what doesn't. Well, yeah, and I mean, like, when it came down to it, um, you know, the, they didn't actually say the name of the act, but, um, like, the, 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 the judge was talking about a particular, saying, you know, just, well, okay, a, a particular act could have been implemented here, um, 
And the only act that I can think of that would have um, turned the case around that way would have been the um, Imperial Laws Application Act 1988. Because under six, uh, Section 6A, Subsection 2, it states in there that every other piece of legislation, including the subordinate legislation within the um, Imperial Laws Application Act 1988, is secondary legislation in New Zealand. And that the Imperial, so that makes the Imperial Laws Application Act 1988 the primary legislation in New Zealand. In other what, words, what about, overrules the Bill of Rights. What about, say, the Petition of Rights 1688? Is that still primary or is it secondary? Going by going by the Imperial Laws Application at six um, six A, no, because everything sub everything subordinate to it, secondary legislation to it, including its own subsections. So the Imperial Laws Application Act. Yeah. Mm -hmm.